just remembered. I left a cauldron of soup on the fire. You witches do eat a great deal. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode in the series of things you may have missed in The Witcher 3. Ah! It's been a while since the previous one. I was busy with the Netflix show, but I'm back into the swing of things. As usual, let me warn you that this video will be full of spoilers. The game has been out for nearly 7 years now, but I know some of you still wish to avoid them, so be careful. Also, before we begin, allow me to plug my Witcher Details playlist. It has over 100 videos which might pique your interest. There's a link to all that in the description. Alright, enough lollygagging, let's begin with number 1. There are several small details here, and it all starts with Triss. Triss. Stop thinking with your vagina. Specifically, her quest to get the mages out of Novigrad. You remember how, while you're looking for a way through the sewers, you find a breakable wall, behind which a sort of library is hidden with all kinds of rare books. A library? By the way, I like Triss's voice acting in this section. You can hear a bit of a crack in her voice as she says that she won't be coming back. Rare, first editions only. We'll come back for them later. No, we won't. I leave Novigrad today, remember? I remember. Just having a hard time coming to grips with it. But anyway, the first thing you may have missed here is that this is actually a barricaded basement of sorts that is likely a part of the central library in Novigrad. If you enter said library while on this quest, you can see that you are basically standing right on top of your quest marker. So, given that there are burning books just outside, Last chance to surrender unorthodox books. Grimoires and tracts blaspheming the sacred flame especially. It's possible that whoever owns this place sealed the most precious tomes underground and away from the witch hunters. Also, there are a couple of fun bits inside the library. Other than the Alvin reference from Witcher 1, the first is a Shakespearean Twilight easter egg, where Bella tells Edward simultaneously that she's carrying his child and that she's in love with, uh, what was his name, the werewolf guy. And the other one is a book that tells us how to divine the future through the use of cheese. You know, things like melting two different types of cheese into white wine, then sticking a piece of bread into the bubbly goo and looking at its shadow on candlelight to tell how your next child will look like or something. And speaking of children, we move to number two. I'm sure most of you know that if you convince Sarah to stop tormenting Corinne Tilly, you can later find the two of them living together in peace. And if you don't, you can then find her with Johnny in Bald Mountain. But there's another interesting bit in that case as well. When you go back to the house with Avalach towards the end of the game, you meet a boy who tells you that his parents are fighting and lets you in. Will you let us in? I will. Well, what you may have missed is that if you go upstairs, you can actually witness the argument. Don't know why Mum's so angry with Pa. Pa's real nice. Stinks of gin and piss sometimes. But he bought me some new toys today. Wooden blocks and a three-wheel cart. Shame the wheels are missing. Don't bother me, please. As you ascend, it's a little hard to hear, but the woman is asking the man what he sees in that other woman he's been bubbering. <clears throat> Fucked. And she's wondering if it's her cooking or her skills with the broom. But he says... Her ass! Mommy! That's what's better! You soft-cock fool! Oh, I beg to differ! Huh? Why even say that? Have I insulted you? You... You... I was faking it! Every time! Mommy! And who might you be? Bringing your drinking mates home now, is that it? I don't know them! Mommy. Likely! Get the hell out of my house! Was just on my way out. Get out! And with that, we move on to number three, which once again involves Avalach, and it's actually brought to you by a viewer of mine called Dark1624. It's about the part right afterwards where you traverse the desert planet, which Avalach reveals to have once been the bottom of a vast sea. Look a bit like the bed of a giant river. Or the bottom of a sea. 
And then there's a twist in the end of the story where it turns out that the sentient life, which drained this world dry, so to speak, was apparently the sea itself. No creatures, merely a sea. Trying to say that. Now, all this appears to be a reference to a novel called Solaris, written in 1961 by Polish writer Stanislaw Lem, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, which sadly I haven't read. Probably should look into it because it does sound quite interesting. Now, before I move on, I've got another couple of things to share with you about these worlds you travel to. First, and this is more of a fun development fact, all of them are actually located on the same physical map or surface, or however it's called. If you unlock your camera, you can actually travel to the world that was overtaken by the White Frost, as well as to the Poisonous Area. And while that area doesn't really have anything too interesting, at least nothing that I've found so far, the snowy place has a number of rather grim notes left behind by various people, NL perhaps, or other elves. There's a name that looks to be in Elder Speech, but regardless of their origin, they were all scared and desperate and ultimately incapable of overcoming the White Frost. Also, at one point, there was a bug that I think was fixed. You could actually light up a torch and just walk around wherever you wish. The torch would act as though there's a fire next to you and it would negate all the effects of the cold. But sadly, at least on my end, it hasn't been working for some time. But I swear it worked in the beginning, I've used it plenty of times. And speaking of bugs, it's time for number 4. This one is about the Care Troll the Blacksmith. He is another NPC, right next to the Armorers. However, at least on PC, he has been bugged since the launch of the game, I think. And you can't interact with him. However, what you may have missed here is that there is a tiny window of opportunity during which you can actually talk to him. And this one is also brought to you by a viewer of mine, this time by the name of Kellens or Kellents. Anyhow, here's what you have to do. Get to the point where you are escorting Yennefer inside Kertrolda's castle for the funeral feast and then simply leave. Let her show off her dress to the seals and go to this area. What's this? That's, Geralt, uh, do you think I donned an evening dress to show off for the seals? Just want to get some air. And there we go, he's now interactable. What's more, he has a curious thing to say about one of his swords. Interested in the weapon? There's a tale behind every item I've got. Tell me a story about one of your weapons. See this sword? You know by its crafter's mark that it was forged in the Isles. Belonged to Lars. It would have been the same age as I. What happened to him? His wife went missing during a nasty storm. It was said the goddess smiled fondly on her, so Lars refused to believe she was truly dead. He ran out on the rocks and begged Freya to give his wife back, left his sword behind to show the gods humility, and never returned for it. Selling that same sword now? We could have tossed it in the sea, but Fish got no use for blades. He had no family, so I'm selling it. To the right man. Sadly, when you browse his inventory, he doesn't seem to be selling any curious swords at all. As far as I can tell, this is the only one that originates from Skellige, and it's nothing too special. Ha! A stick! <laughs> Additionally, there's a brief and rather grim side quest involving him and his family. Another victim. You should probably try completing it before meeting Yennefer, so you can easily deliver it within this window of time. It's actually not too far from where you first arrive in Skellige. Interested in a weapon? There's a tale behind every item I've got. I think I have something that was meant for you. A letter from me mom. Says here me sis was bringing it. How'd you come by it? Came across some bodies in the woods, victims of a monster attack. Found this letter on one of the dead, a woman. Sing is dead. Ah, told her and mom so many times. Come over, live with me. No, I had to stay on Pharaoh. I gotta send someone to fetch her body. I'm sorry. Thanks for bringing word. 
Not every man will go to the trouble. Here, take this. A letter from me mum. Says here me sis was bringing it. How'd you come by it? You don't want to know. Huh? Why in blazes not? You robbed her. Killed her, didn't you? And your conscience eats you now. I'd not have expected anything else from the likes of you. Out of my sight, you flea-bitten mutant! What do you want now? Sod off or I'll send your teeth down your throat and out your arse! Oh, and you can play Gwent with him, of course. Uh, I got the Clear Skies card after I won. But back to his bugged state, I did a bit of cheating, and it turns out that if you manage to force yourself through the door before meeting Yennefer in this place, you can once again interact with the blacksmith. So it turns out that the funeral feast quest is what triggers the bug. To Bran. And he becomes unavailable afterwards. Geralt. We should go now. I tried meditating, I tried coming here after blood and wine, I tried talking to him while he's banging on the sword or when he's sitting down, but it never works. So if you know of any way to unbug him, please let me know. And if you don't, and you're looking for some extra bit of dialogue, just leave Yennefer and come here for a brief chat and the game of Gwent. And speaking of Gwent, we move on to number five. Oh, what was that? It can't be all sweetness and light. You know the scholar who teaches you how to play the game in the Inn of White Orchard? Aldert Git, assistant professor in contemporary history at Oxenfurt Academy. Geralt of Rivia, Witcher with tenure. It is very likely that he is one of the people on the hanged man's tree in Velen. Beneath one of the bodies, pretty much as soon as you arrive, you can find an unfinished book which talks about the exact same things as he was. About the issues of studying history from dusty tomes in libraries, and the urge to witness it all firsthand and report every detail precisely as it is. I've a thirst no dusty old tomes can quench. I wish to see the Nilfgaardian invasion with my own eyes, understand it, and record it all in my chronicle, my magnum opus. Well, it would appear that, as he was writing his magnum opus, something unfortunate happened to him. Geralt could in fact be right when he said, Boots. Come again? He'll kill you for your boots. Because the body does appear to be missing boots, although some of the others are missing them as well. The clothes are also not the same, but the book most certainly appears to be his, and uh, he is in fact missing from White Orchard the moment you reach Velen, so I'm pretty sure it's him. And in case you're wondering, it doesn't seem to matter if you encouraged him or warned him against it. So it's a shame, I liked the guy. I liked his introduction, I think it's quite cleverly written. On one hand it's a simple Gwent tutorial, but on the other it also does quite a bit of world building in a incredibly brief exchange between him and one of the locals. It shows us that there are scientists and universities around, people with vastly different levels of education and um, erudition, whatever the word is, and it also shows us that this world, although appearing to be quite similar to our own Middle Ages, is a lot more advanced in some areas. What a waste of time! The Earth shall revolve around the Sun before you comprehend these rules. It's basically doing a lot of the stuff that the Netflix show often fails to do. But I've talked enough about that during the past few months, so let's get to number six. It's not a game for everyone. Requires an analytical mind. Here we have a few secret brothels of sorts. First one is the Cunny of the Goose. I'm sure you guys know the place, but what you may not have noticed about it is that, probably fitting to its name, inside there is a hidden and more adult section. I mean, there are already some scantily clad women inside, but behind this curtain, we have this. Lovely scar. Wanna see mine? Greetings, white hair. You can't actually come here by any normal means, but you could sort of observe what's happening inside from a small window outside. This reminds me a bit of the House of Respite. 
You can enter this place only while wearing Nilfgaardian gear. The formal clothes from Emir's audience will do, as well as the Nilfgaardian set from Crow's Perch. Um, there is likely a way to jump yourself into it somehow. But regardless, no matter what you're wearing, the more scandalous section of it is always off limits for Geralt. Also, it's worth mentioning that once the gate is open for you, it stays open even if you don't have the Nilfgaardian attire. And speaking of naked women, time to talk about number 7. Uh, I don't look forward to censoring this section because it may be hard to appease YouTube, but um, it's a couple of things about Brooksay. Things like me. Once again, it is at least partially brought to you by a viewer of mine. In fact, it's the same person who shared that detail about renovating Corvo Bianco during the vampire attacks. But now there is something else. The first thing he noticed is something that, if you think about it, is quite obvious from a realistic perspective, but it's a great thing that they implemented it into the game as well. You know how Brooksay will occasionally try to jump on you and bite you? Well, if you haven't drunk any black blood, they will attempt to do it again in the fight. But if you have, and they hurt themselves in the process... They will never try to bite you anymore. Another thing he mentioned is that Brooksay and Alps, although having basically the same ability, have different sound effects for their screams. But it actually helped me find another rather amazing detail in my opinion. Here's the thing. The Brooksa's voice changes after she drinks your blood if you have already taken the black blood potion. I guess it affects her vocal cords or her throat or something, but she starts sounding a little different when she screams after that point. Okay, a bit of an interruption. I'm recording this part several days later as I'm putting the video together and I'm no longer sure if this detail is as amazing as I thought. I seem to remember a distinct difference, but now that I'm comparing the screams, they're not all that different. I'll let you decide, but I still think there's a bit of a difference. Normally, when the Brooks screams, it sounds as though there are many voices going off at the same time. But after you use Black Blood, she sounds a little lower pitched and more like a single voice. I'm not sure if I'm making any sense. Let me just play them a couple of times side by side and you tell me if you hear anything different or if I'm imagining things. Okay, at number 8 we have likely the smallest detail in the list, no pun intended because it's about halflings, and it's also brought to you by a viewer who has already made several appearances on my channel, namely Gaming Solves My Issues. So, you know these guys? Holofernus Meyersdorf at your service. Meet my sons, Bernie, Franklin and Hugo. They own quite the large house, but some things in it are quite small. We can see some halfling-sized chairs, as well as a halfling-sized bedroom with a smaller bed, smaller drawers and so on. I guess they haven't gone all out to make everything smaller, some things appear to be regular sized, but nevertheless it's worth mentioning and it's something that I never noticed myself. What's more, while I was recording this, I suddenly realized that I need to try something else, which I might just do for the next video, but I would like to ask you as well. Do you know if anything about this quest, the Apiarian Phantom, changes based on your interaction with that halfling spy in Horson's Casino? He's also a member of this family. What's your name? Rico. Rico Meyersdorf. Holofernus Meyersdorf at your service. Meet my sons. Bernie, Franklin, and Hugo. Something's destroyed our fields and hives. We think it's 
the Apiarian Phantom. It's definitely something I need to look into. Just remembered, I left a cauldron of soup on the fire. And finally, we've come to the end at number 9. Now, why only 9 details, you might ask, and not 10? Well, I have many 10 details about X already, so I thought I should start differentiating them somehow by the number. Maybe I'll do 8 next time or 11. But regardless, at number 9, we have something small about Avalach again. It's in his lab, right after the piece of dialogue where Yennefer is clearly hiding something from Ciri. Did you have a hand in... in what Geralt mentioned? The work of those human mages? Of course not. Truth be told, Yennefer never really did anything malicious against Ciri. She divulged information with the Lodge that she probably shouldn't have. But anyway, the detail you may have missed here is right here. Yes, it is in fact invisible for some reason, but it's there. I suppose this is some sort of vestigial note that they forgot to remove. And the reason why I think so is the fact that there are two typos in it. First off, it says, prior to his, success seemed possible. And it should be, prior to this, aka before we lost the king, success seemed possible. And later it says, I have concluded that putting pressure on here had a very negative impact on our relationship. And it should instead be putting pressure on her. So this note goes into events from the books where Avalach was attempting to renew the Elder Blood gene by having Ciri get pregnant from the Elven King, who was actually Ciri's great, 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 several times great grandfather. Now, I don't think that that's something that CDPR wanted to remove from the story, because there are references to the fact that Avalach potentially only wishes to use Ciri, and that perhaps he's not to be trusted, and how Ciri feels about what he's been doing. And also we see the potion, which Eredin gives to the king. He gave him this potion under the pretext that it was supposed to help him conceive a child with Ciri. Now, the reason why he needed help was, um, well, he was like a million years old, and not terribly into it, to begin with. But ultimately, even in The Witcher 3, it's not entirely clear whether Avalach cares about Ciri as a human being, or sees her simply as a dangerous tool which should be used properly and shouldn't fall into the wrong hands. Damn it! Which might actually be enough, if you think about it, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on the matter and how you feel about Avalach and his relationship with Ciri. And speaking of really old elves, Avalach is one such example as well, which begs the question if he truly had a romantic relationship with this elf, or, you know, what's her purpose in here? <laughs> Didn't know he had a sweet tooth. Feel like I've walked into somebody's bedroom. And by the way, even though she seems young, she speaks as though she knew Lara Doran. Like what? He said you shared Lara's features. I don't see whatever it is he sees. It seems a bit like trying to drink water from a mud puddle. So, is she almost as old as Avalach? I, I don't know. And that's all I had for number 9. But you know what, let me give you another tiny one to make it to 10. So, did you know that Wispes, the crone, lived in Tucson at one point? presumably before she turned into what she is now. It says so on this quick travel marker. It also suggests that once upon a time she wasn't that bad, and also goes into how she was killed. Sadly, I wasn't able to find anything of note inside the cave. Perhaps I should investigate the matter even further. And with that, I believe we're done. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to give it a like, subscribe to the channel if you haven't, and as usual, Tell me what you thought of everything I talked about. Was there anything you missed or anything else you think I should have mentioned? Feel free to let me know. Okay, thank you very much for watching. Special thanks to my supporters and YouTube members. And until the next video, stay tuned and be good. They ran from you, didn't they? Lying prick! <laughs> Yeah!
Enough! 